In lecture 33b, we're going to start off pretty concrete with a three-dimensional example of a quadratic form whose symmetric matrix representative is a 3 by 3 matrix. In the context of that example, we will review the principal axis theorem and the characterization of quadratic forms in terms of their eigenvalues and whether they are positive definite, negative definite, or indefinite. Then we'll get more theoretical. We will re review inner product spaces, norm spaces, and metric spaces. Orthogonal decomposition and best approximation in inner product spaces is something new. Then we'll end lecture 33b by looking at a couple of important inequalities and their proofs if we have time. Something called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and the triangle inequality on inner product spaces. I've talked about those with dot products before, but now we can talk about them with inner products. We will do an example with a function space along the way as well. Um, and that will be ultimately related to Fourier series. Okay, so let's start again with our review. Uh, first of all, the principal axes theorem. Let A be an n by n symmetric matrix. Symmetric matrices are very special. The spectral theorem guarantees that they have real eigenvalues, that there are n real eigenvalues counting multiplicities, that the eigenspaces all have a dimension equal to the uh, dimension of, the, well, the multiplicity of the corresponding eigenvalues, and they are orthogonally diagonalizable. There's an orthogonal matrix P such that P transpose AP is diagonal, and it's easy to find transposes. Essentially, there is a change of variable. P is an orthogonal matrix here. Its inverse is its transpose that converts this quadratic form, X transpose AX, into a new quadratic form in new coordinates, U transpose DU, with no cross product terms. In other words, D is a diagonal matrix. We have orthogonally diagonalized A to a new coordinate system where there's no cross terms. It's much easier to tell whether it's a positive definite, negative definite, or indefinite form. And in fact, that is characterized ultimately by this definition and this theorem. The definition says a quadratic form, which a function from R into R, is positive definite if it's always positive when the input is non-zero. It's negative definite if the Output is always negative when the input is non-zero. When the input equals zero, the outputs of these functions are zero. And it's indefinite if q of x assumes both positive and negative eigenvalues. This theorem characterizes the nature of it in terms of the eigenvalues. It's positive definite if and only if all the eigenvalues are positive. Negative definite if and only if the eigenvalues are all negative. And indefinite if there's a combination of both positive and negative eigenvalues that, that's related to this theorem and this definition. Let's look at an example in Mathematica. I did not put the example in the PowerPoint because I didn't have time. But here's a 3x3 three three matrix. You can see that is symmetric. It's important to use symmetric matrices here so that you can apply the spectral theorem. Notice the first column equals the first row as far as the numbers and their orders, 7, negative 4, 4. Second column equals the second row. Third column is the same as the third row. The transpose of this, where you swap the rows and columns, is itself. These negative 4s match across the main diagonal. These positive 4s match, and these zeros match. The numbers in the main diagonal can be any real numbers. What is the quadratic form? x transpose ax turns out to equal this. Mathematic is giving me the output as a one by one matrix, but we can think of this as a number and get rid of the parentheses if we like. And so I went ahead and just copied that formula into a function Q. Is this positive definite, negative definite, or indefinite? You could try plugging in points and seeing what kind of output you get. Is it positive, always positive, always negative? You can switch things around. This is no proof. But it might give you the idea, since we keep seeing positive numbers here, that this is positive definite. To know for sure, we can use find the eigensystem, the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. The eigenvalues are 13, 7, and 1, all positive. This quadratic form is, in fact, positive definite. In spite of the fact that this matrix has negative signs here and here for those entries, and also the quadratic form has a negative sign right there. In spite of that, the output of this is never, ever negative. And it's always strictly positive when we don't plug in the origin. We can use the eigenvectors to create an orthogonal matrix with 
those as columns. We need to normalize those, divide them by their lengths, which is square root of 9 or 3. That'll be a matrix, an orthogonal matrix that orthogonally diagonalizes um, A. You can see that the inverse of P is its transpose. Compare this matrix with this, and you see that they are transposes of each other. P itself is not a symmetric matrix. It's orthogonal. Its inverse is its transpose. But then if we compute P transpose times A times P, we do get a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues 13, 7, 1 on the main diagonal. Is there a way to visualize this function Q? Sort of, but it's difficult to understand. Contour plot 3D can do it, but you need to make sure you understand what you're seeing. What you're seeing here are a bunch of level surfaces of this function. With functions of two variables, you have level curves where the function is constant. Here we have a function of three variables, x, y, and z. These surfaces, which you're just seeing pieces of, are surfaces along where the function is constant. And the most inner one looks like it's almost some sort of higher dimension, dimensional version of an ellipse. In fact, it is. It's called an ellipsoid. And in fact, all these things are ellipsoids. ellipsoids. We're just not seeing the full ellipsoids. And if you plug in values of the function anywhere here besides the origin, you do get positive outputs. And that's what's being indicated by these being ellipsoids. If there were some other object, like there was something called hyperboloids of two sheets and hyperboloids of one sheet, then it would not be positive definite. Negative definite contour maps in this context look like ellipsoids as well, but the outputs are negative instead of positive. All right, now on to our main content. That was a review and a new example. Here's more review. These next, I think, two slides. It is review from lecture 32B. I'm going to go pretty quick. This is theory here. Then we'll get into some new examples and applications, and again, into um, what well, I forgot what the last topic was for this lecture. Oh, um, yeah, Cauchy Schwartz inequality and triangle inequality, generalizing. An inner product on a vector space, an inner product, vector, inner product space V is a vector space that has an inner product defined on it. This is a function taking an ordered pair of inputs, one vector from V in the first coordinate, you might say, and another vector from V in the second coordinate, though you don't use parentheses or square brackets, you use pointy brackets traditionally here, and giving you a number as output that satisfies a commutative property, satisfies a distributive property, an associative property, and non-negativity. If you take the inner product of a vector in V with itself, you get something that can't be negative. It must be greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, it only equals zero when the vector itself is the zero vector. This is a definition. When we do the theory about inner product spaces, we assume these things are true. We take them as axioms. If you want to apply the theory to particular examples, you need to verify these for the example. And uh, anytime you have an inner product space, you can define the size of a vector, its magnitude, its norm, analogous to dot product. You take the square root of the inner product of the vector with itself. We can also define a metric, a distance function, by taking the distance between any two vectors, u and v, to be the norm of their difference, which can also be written as the square root of the inner product of the difference with itself. Here's an, here's an example, which we will expand on in a bit here. You know, v is this function space, CAB, the vector space of all real value continuous functions on this interval from A to B. They're continuous on the entire interval. The inner product is from, well, it's not the previous lecture. It's from two lectures ago, though I didn't mention this in the previous lecture. It involves the integral. The inner product of one of these functions with um, another function is the integral of the product of the functions over the interval from A to B. And certainly if your functions are continuous, then this integral will exist. It'll be a well-defined number. I can compute that for any two functions, f and g, in this vector space. And I can compute the distance between two functions in terms of the inner product, ultimately in terms of an integral. And now I didn't make a typo. I put the square root in there as it should be at the end. We'll talk about this more intuitively. I did a little bit in lecture 32b, but 
we want to go on here today, and what would it mean for two functions to be orthogonal? Let's see, we're going to look at an example very soon. In fact, here's a definition of orthogonal in an inner product space. Two vectors u and v in capital V are said to be orthogonal. What should we do? How about generalize the dot product definition of orthogonal, which was u dot v equals zero. Now it's the inner product of u and v being zero. This does apply to dot products. Dot products are inner products, by the way. Are they the only kind of inner product for finite dimensional vectors? Actually, no. There are, there are more inner products than just the standard one. Another definition. A vector u and v is said to be a unit vector if and only if its magnitude is 1, which is equivalent to the inner product of the vector with itself being 1. That's the notion of a unit vector. We're going to apply this mostly to function spaces, so you might imagine these things as being functions, u and v as being functions, though I'm not using function notation. This is just analogies with what we've done in more familiar spaces. But it works. Another definition. Let w be a subspace of v. Now, an orthogonal basis for w is a basis that is an orthogonal set, meaning the sets are mutually orthogonal to each other, the vectors in the set. And it's going to be an orthonormal basis if it's also an orthonormal set. In other words, it consists of vectors which are also unit vectors that are mutually orthogonal. Their inner product with any two distinct vectors is zero. Here's an example. This is our main example um, in this part of the lecture, 33b. We'll do more theory again, theorems and proofs here. <clears throat> Example, confirm that this set of two functions, which are vectors in this vector space, right, those are continuous on the entire interval from negative pi to pi. They're continuous on bigger intervals, too. With respect to our previously defined inner product that involved the integral, the corresponding norm, and the corresponding distance, if we want to think about those things, we want to confirm this is an orthogonal set. Note that does not mean the graphs of cosine and sine intersect at right angles. They don't. Graph of cosine looks like this. From 0 to 2 pi, that's cos t. Graph of sine looks like this. Let me get this right. Like a vowel like that. These are supposed to line up. I didn't line them up. Are they intersecting at right angles? Well, it looks like they might be, but they're not. I'm almost positive. And it doesn't matter. That's not the issue. The issue is, in a sense, whether their product has an even amount of area with above, uh, under the curve when it's above the axis with below the curve when it's below the axis because the integral of the product has to be zero. It is related to that and the fact that they often have the same sign and they often have opposite signs, but that's certainly not real precise intuition. Oh, where did my clicker go? Here it is. So we want to verify that these, this is an orthogonal set. Let's also construct an orthonormal basis for the span of those two, the set of all linear combinations of cosine and sine. It itself is not an orthonormal basis because these are not normalized. It's already a basis, though these are linearly independent functions. So we need to do some integrals. The inner product of cosine with sine is this integral, which can be seen to be zero. If you have trouble doing the integral, you can think about going from here to here with a substitution. Let u equal sine t then d would be cos t dt, and you'd get one half u squared, but u is sine t, so you get one half sine squared. Plug in pi and negative pi, you get zero. Zero minus zero is zero. Cosine and sine are orthogonal to each other in, with respect to the inner product we've defined on this vector space, this inner product space. How do we normalize them? Take their inner products with themselves. Inner product of cosine with itself is the integral of cos squared. 
How do you do that integral? You can look it up. There's tables, there's Mathematica. You can also use the trigonometric identity. Cos squared t turns out equals 1 half plus 1 half cos 2t. That is a trig identity you can look up. To help you finish this by hand, when you plug the numbers in here and subtract, you get pi in the end. You end up with pi over 2 minus negative pi over 2. And the signs of these things are 0. Sign of 2 times those things are 0. You end up with pi. Similar thing happens with the inner product of sine with itself, you still end up with pi. So in order to normalize cosine and sine, I need to divide by the norm of cosine and sine, which is going to be square root of pi, square root of the inner product of these things with themselves. This set is an orthonormal basis for doing. Why will that be helpful? Because the orthogonal decomposition theorem generalizes. But to use the orthogonal decomposition theorem, you need, well, ideally, it's nice if you have orthonormal vectors. You can get away with orthogonal ones, but it's nicer if you have orthonormal ones. More new stuff. Let V be an inner product space. And let, suppose you've got two vectors, V and Y in V. With V being non-zero, we can define orthogonal projections. Think about the formula for orthogonal projections in Rn. Say the orthogonal projection of uh, y along v. We've used this a, a fair amount recently. There's the formula for the projection of y along v when you were talking about ordinary vectors in Rn with a dot product being our inner product. Just generalize that to inner products. Y hat, the projection of Y along W, which is the span of V. Is the span aligned to the origin? Well, it could be. Or you could just imagine it to be if it's not literally in the usual sense. Use inner products instead of dot products. Inner product of Y with B divided by the inner product of V with itself times the vector V. This is a scalar times a vector. Though the vector could be a function. That's the projection, completely analogous to the dot product. You can define orthogonal complements. If you got a, W is a subspace of V, which is an inner product space. Oh, and I typo here. W perp is the sum of all x and V, not whose dot product is zero, but whose inner product is zero for all W in W. It's all the vectors in V that are orthogonal to all the vectors in W under the given inner product. Here's our orthogonal decomposition theorem, just like before. Here it looks like there are no typos. I'm using inner products instead of dot products. This formula is completely analogous to what we did with dot products. Each piece is analogous to this. Again, our main application of this is going to be to function spaces. x1 through xp will be functions that are an orthogonal basis for some subspace of v, which could be c of ab. And y hat is going to be the projection on that finite dimensional subspace. It is a finite dimensional subspace. So it's also not trivial. I don't, I don't want it to be the, uh, just the zero vector. Best approximation theorem still holds. Let W be a finite dimensional subspace of an inner product space V. Given any vector Y in V, the projection vector Y hat is the unique vector in W that is closest to Y. In fact, the norm of the difference, the distance between Y and Y hat, is less than the distance between Y and V for all V and W that are distinct from Y hat. Completely analogous to what we talked about before with vectors we can visualize. It still works. What this is telling us is the abstract properties of inner products is what makes these things work. It's not the fact that before we were visualizing the vectors as two-dimensional vectors or three-dimensional vectors. It made intuitive sense then, but it's the abstract properties of dot products, which we generalize to inner products, that makes these work. And this is important, okay? And again, what we're going to be doing with Fourier series is applying these things. Maybe the x's are cosines and sines of various frequencies. 
cos t, cos 2t, cos 3t, etc. Sine t, sine 2, sine 2t, sine 3t, etc. To apply this as written, w does need to be finite dimensional, so this needs to be a finite set. Y is some other function not in W, like t squared or something, t cubed, e to the t. But you're after your best approximation on a certain interval. It, the, the answer does depend on the interval that you use. That does make a difference, because that affects the inner product, so it affects the answer. We're looking for best approximations on certain intervals. All right, final few slides here. Restate the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality and the triangle inequality using inner product spaces. I have mentioned these theorems before. i am also included the proofs in these slides, and I will quickly go through them. They're a little tricky, but they are understandable when you see them. Let V be an inner product space, and suppose that U and V are in capital E, the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality says that the absolute value of the inner product of u and v is less than or equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. Of course, these things can be written in terms of inner products as well. Magnitude of u, remind you, would be the square root of the inner product of u with itself. Similar kind of thing for the magnitude of v. By the way, this fact would imply that the inequality without the absolute value signs would also be true. If I got rid of the absolute value signs on this side, it would still be true. This gen is a more general fact that would imply that. Here's a proof. The proof is trivial in the case where u is 0. Why is it trivial? Well, because if u is 0, <clears throat> it does turn out the inner product um, this would take proof, but the inner product of any vector, zero vector with any vector is zero. The norm of the zero vector is zero. Both sides are zero in that case. That is not something that I prove, but it can be proved. So assume u is non-zero and let w be the span of u. W is the subspace of v that is the all scalar multiples of the vector u, the non-zero vector u. All right, now I'm about to show you a bunch of equalities that each step of which is fairly easy to see is true, but it's not obvious that this is something that would be useful in helping you prove it. What is the magnitude of the projection in V along W? To go from here to here, I just need the definition of the projection vector. Projection of v along w is the inner product of v with u divided by the inner product of oh, another typo, sorry about all the typos, of u with itself. Times the vector u. What's the magnitude of that vector, which is a scalar times u? Turns out you can factor out the scalar like this as long as you include the absolute value signs. Turns out the absolute value of a ratio is the ratio of the two absolute values. I can get rid of the absolute value sign on the bottom. The inner product of u with itself is always non-negative, and I'm assuming u is non-zero, so it's also positive. And it does equal the magnitude of u squared. Finally, this cancels with one of those. Simplifying to that. Why did I do this? It's not so clear until I show you the next step. But the projection of v along w has a magnitude less than or equal to v itself. Why? I'm not going to prove it, but intuitively it should make sense. It's because this is true if you draw a picture, if you're thinking ordinary vectors. If this is v, and here's your projection vector along some other vector, The vector z will be here. Certainly the length of the hypotenuse here is less than or equal to the sum of the lengths of the other two sides. The shortest distance between any two points is along a straight line between them. Does that apply to inner product spaces? It turns out it does. I'm not proving it. 
How do I go from here to here? Just make a replacement. And then you're done after you multiply both sides by the magnitude of u. Okay, so it's a bit tricky, but understandable if, if you believe these properties of inner products and you believe this, which I hinted at, definitely can be proven to be true. We prove the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Corollary of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality is that it allows us to define the angle between any two vectors in an inner product space to be the inverse cosine of this thing. No absolute value signs here. The fact that the absolute value of this is less than or equal to that means if you divide both sides by this, the absolute value divided by that is less than or equal to 1, which means if you get rid of the absolute value signs, it's between negative 1 and 1. Exactly the domain of the inverse cosine function. That's why it allows us to define the angle as this inverse cosine. Whether this is useful or not is not so clear. Though we will see it is useful when theta is 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians when they are orthogonal, it definitely will be useful. It's not so clear whether this is useful in general. Final slide here, I think. The triangle inequality. What's the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality good for? It's actually good for a lot of things, which we're not getting into. It's also good for proving the triangle inequality, which seems a little bit more basic of an inequality when you think about pictures, and I've drawn pictures before. And you might say is used more often than the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, at least at the basic level. The magnitude of u plus v is less than or equal to the magnitude of u plus the magnitude of v. And this makes sense if you draw pictures with ordinary vectors. There's u, here's v. There's u plus v. Once again, the length of that side is less than or equal to the sum of the lengths of these two sides. It doesn't have to be a right triangle there. Here's the proof. It's a seven-step calculation using properties of norms and products that just proven the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, along with taking a positive square root at the end. Mm -hmm. How in the world am I going to approach this? What in the world am I saying here? You start with the square of that thing. Let me just say at the outset that the square of the norm of u plus v is the inner product of u plus v with itself. And you go from there. How? <laughs> That's not so clear. This is analogous to u plus v dot u plus v and you might hope there's the distributive property could be used. You could maybe foil this. That can be justified first times first, or first dot first. First outside, inside last means first dot first plus outside dot outside plus inside dot inside plus last dot last is a kind of foiling, and it does work because the distributive property applied twice essentially. This vector uh, can be put through the parentheses there if you include dot products appropriately. Here's the first couple steps then. There's the first thing I just sh showed you up there. And going from here to here is essentially foiling. U dot U Um, is, well, u dot u, <laughs> inner product of u with itself. u dot v, or the inner product of u with v, and the inner product of v with u are the same. Inner products are commutative. So you really get two times the inner product of u with v. And then the inner product of v with itself is written here. This can be proved. It's an abstract form of FOIL for inner product spaces. This looks promising. That's the magnitude of u squared. That's the magnitude of v squared. We're getting close to the right-hand side there, but what about that? That's not a magnitude. 
it's itself, which is what I wrote there, inner product of u with v is less than or equal to the absolute value of the inner product of u with v. Right? Any number is less than or equal to its absolute value. Negative 5 is less than or equal to 5. Positive 5 is less than or equal to 5. These two things are numbers. And, hmm, what I circled here looked like the left-hand side of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. That's going to be less than or equal to 2 times the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v, which basically means we're almost done because this thing can be factored. Don't let all the crazy symbols bother you. That's the same as the magnitude of u plus the magnitude of v quantity squared. So we ultimately have this thing is less than or equal to this thing with the less than or equal to sign. These things are positive. I can take the positive square root of both sides and conclude that the triangle inequality is true. So some pretty abstract stuff here in lecture 33b. 34b, we're going to look, start looking at Fourier series in more depth. Ultimately, also getting to partial differential equations and maybe even a little bit in 34b. Thanks for watching.